Good evening, uh, everyone. Good morning, uh, depending on where you're you're signing in from. Um, as we're filling in from uh, the waiting room, if you want to take a minute and um, go over to the chat and and just type in where you're zooming in from, um, it's it's nice to sort of see people coming in from all over the world. Uh, that gives us a nice way to see who's who's signing on. Bangladesh, welcome. Indiana, Washington State, Georgia, Mississippi, awesome. Welcome. We'll wait just a couple more seconds. Uh, people are still jumping on here. Ghana. Okay. That looks pretty good. So uh, good evening or good morning, good afternoon. Um, my name is Greg Grayson. I'm a faculty member here in the Department of Polymer Science and Engineering at UMass Amherst, and I'm the graduate program director. And I first want to thank you for taking the time uh, to join us. Um, for a little bit of time uh, so we can introduce the PhD program here uh, in polymer science and engineering at UMass Amherst uh, and uh, tell you a little bit about what you you, you might want to be thinking about uh, as you uh, consider applying to graduate school. So before we begin, um, we have uh, some nice uh, pictures here of uh, UMass uh, Amherst. Uh, this is the polymer science and engineering building. Um, if, you, if you've if you never been to Amherst, Massachusetts, Amherst, Massachusetts is right here uh, in, in Amherst. Here's um, uh, Cape Cod. Here's Boston. We're about two hours west of Boston. New York City is somewhere down here. Um, the weather in Amherst uh, looks pretty much like these pictures. In fact, these two photos I, I took walking around this afternoon. This is exactly what it looks like today. Uh, it's gorgeous. Um, OK, so, so what are we going to do uh, th this evening? Just a quick agenda. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes to give an overview of the the uh, PhD program in polymer science and engineering. Um, tell you why you should apply, who we are, um, um, what the program is like, and and kind of a little bit about pathways uh, uh, outside uh, for careers outside of your PhD. Um, and then I want to invite um, some st current students and an alumni uh, uh, alumnus to uh, have a answer some of the questions you sent in, right? So we took the questions that you asked during registration, and I'm going to put those to some current students and alumni to try to give you their perspective um, about application and life in graduate school. And hopefully there'll be a few minutes at the end of the session for some of your questions um, if they're not answered by the panel. Um, and for those of you who have time and, and um, would like to stick around, after this one hour session, we'll switch to another platform called Gather Town. Um, if you wanna stick around and chat with me, um, some of the other uh, students, faculty and, and staff online. Um, and so before I get going, uh, I just wanna introduce uh, two folks here on the Zoom. Uh, so Lisa Groth, this is graduate program manager. Maybe if you wave. Hey everybody, uh, welcome. Uh, um, if you apply, you will certainly be hearing uh, from Lisa and uh, Madeline uh, uh, Golick, who is a staff member who's been helping out, um, uh, really helping out pulling these sessions together. Um, you may also be hearing from Madeline. Okay, so let me begin with why uh, you should consider getting a PhD in uh, polymer science engineering, engineering from, from UMass. And so for us, this is really to produce um, inter interdisciplinary thinkers, uh, people who can approach a problem uh, in soft materials and polymer materials from, from an interdisciplinary perspective, right? That's to say, um, we, we train uh, students from kind of foundational knowledge in, in chemistry, physics, um, uh, and engineering, but we don't produce chemists and physics and, and engineers, we produce uh, polymer scientists and engineers, people who really think in this holistic way about these interdisciplinary challenges. And we like just to, to, to think about sort of focus, the focus of these classical uh, kind of core disciplines through the lens of polymer science and engineering opens up 
um, impacts and sort of knowledge creation across sort of forefront fields in uh, science and, and engineering and technology and really holds the key to solving some of the most important societal challenges from sustainable resources and energy to health and medicine to advanced manufacturing. Okay, so this is the reason why um, uh, why the, the the polymer science engineering program is is uh, you know such a valuable uh, opportunity um, and unique opportunity in the graduate program. Um, many students, uh, in as you uh, registered, uh, have lots of questions about what are the types of research going on uh, in the department. The the, the really the breadth of research is, is sort of overwhelming in, in some in some ways, uh, again, because we're approaching it from engineering, uh, uh, physics, and, and uh, synthetic aspects of, of soft materials. Um, but you can broadly think of, of uh, the applications, uh, current applications being in, again, sustainable resources and energy, materials for life, lifelike materials, uh, and uh, next generation manufacturing. The best way to to kind of learn about and get acquainted with what are the kind of key and forefront research challenges are to take a few moments uh, and kind of work through some of the um, faculty uh, research pages. So this uh, these QR codes you'll see sprinkled throughout this presentation. Um, if if you want, you can uh, click on those. Um, we will be sending a follow up. Um, email uh, to, to all of you with all of these links so you don't have to write it all down on the fly so, so you'll get it uh, later. But uh, again, uh, first you want to spend a little bit of time looking at the faculty research pages, uh, uh, reading about the, the current research going on. Also, I want to draw your attention to our YouTube channel. Um, we've recently uh, reproduced uh, um, uh, uh, introductions from every laboratory in the department. Uh, so this is the really great opportunity for the faculty and the students in these labs to explain what's exciting, what's new uh, about the research in their group. Uh, that'll give you a great introduction to what's going on. Um, be before I go on, um, I, I also want to emphasize something that's very important to our students, and, and I always uh, they always ask me to to bring up um, to prospective students is that you know one of the keys to uh, research in the polymer science engineering is is world class facilities, right? So this is everything from electronic materials characterization, uh, uh, microscopy, electron microscopy, x-ray, high performance computing, and, and on and on. Um, and these are really, uh, you know, very valuable research uh, instruments that are not only available to you, but in, in many or most of these cases, these are in the building, right? So you really just kind of go down the hallway or up a few floors to go and take the sample you make and go do the characterization. Uh, really all, all in the same uh, environment. And this is uh, very uh, valuable for propelling uh, your research. So uh, let me take a few minutes about who um, who we are in polymer science and engineering. And first I'll start uh, by uh, in answering that by introducing the uh, first year incoming PhD class here on the left. Um, there are a couple of unique things about um, us here in PSC. One of the most important things you should know about us is that the, the polymer science and engineering at UMass is a graduate only program. So what that means is that uh, our almost our entire educational uh, mission is focused on producing uh, PhD students, right? This is very unique in comparison to almost any other program in the United States. Um, and what that means is that you, you you have a lot more of the kind of resources and access uh, to the faculty, uh, and the faculty spend much more of their time engaged with graduate student research uh, than in other programs. Um, we are now currently 18 full-time faculty. Uh, I showed you a picture on the start of the building. We're all located in the same building, and this leads to, again, a very cohesive uh, community uh, in our program. And the typical uh, class size for um, uh, entering PhD students is something like 12 to 18 students per year. So 12 to 18 uh, students come every year uh, to join the PhD uh, program. And you can read about the, the, the PSE mission statement here. I just kind of pulled a little bit of a quote here. What this emphasizes uh, is that in our mission to produce the, the leading uh, world-class researchers in polymer science and engineering, we recognize that this relies on, on bringing together people with diverse uh, backgrounds and perspectives to bring to bear on these kind of research challenges. And so 
one part of that is that the uh, the students who apply and enter the PhD program, they come from very diverse undergraduate backgrounds, right? A very small uh, minority of these actually come in with a degree in polymers uh, at the undergraduate level. Um, and so just uh, you really want to emphasize that you, you do not have to have any undergraduate training in polymers in order to apply uh, and be accepted to the polymer science and engineering program at uh, PSC, you have to just have an interest and a curiosity and a passion to learn. And uh, we really wanna hear your story about what brings you uh, to that. A little bit more about the demographics of uh, polymer science engineering uh, at UMass. I'm showing here on the bar chart, um, the breakdown in the percentage of female underrepresented minority uh, in international versus domestic students, uh, the blue, bar here is polymer science and engineering, and the red and gold are two other material science and engineering programs uh, in the United States. Um, you'll see that we're pretty um, uh, fairly well balanced, uh, male to female and domestic international students. Um, <clears throat> by comparison to other programs in the United States, uh, we do uh, relatively well in terms of undergraduate underrepresented minority uh, uh, students. However, we recognize that this is lower than, than what it should be uh, in order to sort of advance uh, our fields uh, and, and make it representative uh, of uh, the broader population. And so to that end, um, you know, UMass, as well as a, our own program, um, are very committed to advancing uh, diversity and equity among uh, STEM and uh, have a range of activities, initiatives, and resources that are aimed at fostering inclusion and success for all. So this is everything from workplace climate committee within the department, as well as uh, graduate school uh, initiatives um, and um, uh, support for students coming from every background uh, and various student groups. I'm very happy to talk to you uh, more about that if you, if you have uh, more things you'd like to know. Um, one big question we get uh, is what is it like? Um, what are the cost of living? Uh, what's the support for students in the PhD program? Uh, so this is an important slide. Um, first here, I wanna emphasize the stipend for uh, PSC students that'll enter next fall will be $36,700 a year uh, or higher with increases thereafter. Um, so you you may hear uh, from other programs, uh, if, if you have an offer, um, they might tell you the total cost of the offer is something in the range of, you know, in, in our case is about $90,000 a year, and that includes the stipend plus tuition plus insurance and benefits. Okay, but you should pay attention to this number. This is the number that you will be getting paid uh, from Polymer Science and Engineering that you will get paid uh, at through your PhD program. Um, for those of you, again, who are looking for um, a little bit more detail, uh, we have a QR code here that links to the a breakdown for a little bit more about the benefits and uh, um, how to compare this offer to other offers. And again, we'll be happy to share that with you via email. Um, I should emphasize that if you're accepted into the PhD program, uh, and PSC, uh, and you continue to make success throughout your, your uh, PhD, uh, you will be fully supported. So if you're accepted into the program, uh, you're provided uh, full support throughout your PhD program. And there's no requirement uh, for TA TAing, right? So there's no, TAing is not a requirement in order to have full support. There are opportunities available. Um, so some students want to have an opportunity to learn uh, to develop as, as training. Uh, for uh, future careers in STEM education. Um, so there are opportunities, but it's not a requirement. And um, if you're looking around, spend some time comparing the cost of living uh, to the Amherst area, it's relatively cheap. Um, so for example, you can compare living around here to Boston, you'll find that um, this stipend um, goes pretty very, very far compared to uh, what it would cost to live in Boston. Um, these are just a few pictures of uh, the area uh, around the Amherst area. It's a beautiful area. We um, Lots of outdoor activities, uh, very safe, um, lots of places, great places to eat uh, and uh, have a lot of fun. Um, you know, please uh, ask questions if you want to learn about what it's like around here. So uh, what is it like uh, what, to, um, uh, to enter the PSE program? What's the uh, 
what are the classes like, what's the uh, course through your PhD. So I'll give you a quick breakdown. Um, it starts in here in the first semester uh, down at the bottom. And um, it's important to emphasize, again, there's no TA ships. And in your first semester, you're uh, fully supported uh, by the department. And that's important because we want all of our students to be enrolled in the same classes together uh, to build this common core foundation that's going to propel them uh, through their through their PhD work, right? So your your kind of key job here is to focus on your courses without um, TA or uh, research requirements. You'll be taking um, three lecture classes. Uh, every student takes polymer physics, polymer chemistry, polymer engineering, as well as two labs, physical characterization and a synthesis lab. And um, we. We recognize, of course, that um, this these, these are very diverse uh, courses. Um, many of you may not have taken chemistry since high school. I didn't take chemistry since high school. Uh, so it, it would be challenging. It would be a challenge for me to, to go through the uh, chemistry program, chemistry classes. Ha however, you know, we intentionally bring students together from different backgrounds so that they can support each other, right? So you may... Uh, may um, have taken already a few courses in uh, engineering. Uh, and so this will help you uh, help your peers in the engineering course, but you might, on the other hand, need some help from them uh, to help you through uh, learning uh, the, the synthesis or and um, polymer chemistry. So through this coursework, uh, at the same time, um, I, I should point out that, that PSE students, when you're admitted to the PhD program, you're not assigned an advisor before you arrive. You come in as a, a, a PSC student um, and you begin the process of selecting your, your PhD advisor after arriving. Um, you will give um, your recommend recommended choices for what PhD uh, group you would like to join following the opportunity to have discussions with um, your potential advisor, as well as the group and visiting the labs, thinking about what kinds of projects might be available. Um, we think this is pretty important. Um, you know, the, your fit with your research group is gonna have a really uh, important impact in your success in graduate school. And we want you to have the opportunity to meet the group, meet the advisor and have discussions uh, before uh, making those type of commitments. Um, we think that's extremely valuable. So on into your second semester, um, you'll continue first year uh, coursework, a smaller number of classes, as well as a cumulative exam process where you're going to be tested on uh, some of these core uh, foundational principles in polymer physics, chemistry, and engineering. Um, I want to emphasize that we have a really high uh, success rate or passage rate of this exam. Um, uh, our purpose is, has never been to, to weed out um, uh, students from the graduate program, but it's really uh, an opportunity for you to reinforce what you've learned in, a, uh, in, in these uh, first semester course. So, for example, if you went through something uh, polymer physics for the first time in the fall semester, but you didn't quite get it as well as, as, you, as you need to kind of go on to your PhD work, you have an opportunity to go back uh, and strengthen those areas. Um, uh, and then finally, on through the second semester, you will begin uh, your, your PhD research starting uh, working in uh, your research lab. Um, on into your second semester, most students will have uh, com um, completed, uh, well, they'll be completing their cumulative exams uh, in into that second year uh, or may already be finished. Um, some students will continue to take uh, advanced topics courses, top advanced topics courses or special topics courses beyond uh, the second year. Many students will just go directly into the lab. Uh, around this time, about 12 months after the cumulative exam, you'll begin uh, planning your prospectus, forming your um, dissertation committee with your uh, dissertation advisor. So on in the, to the third year, there, there are additional uh, requirements for advancement to candidacy, in, in particular, this independent, independent research proposal uh, where that's an opportunity for you to, to to write a proposal in the style of the National Science Foundation or the, um, uh, the, the National Institutes for Health, uh, where you come up with your own independent research idea and write it as if you're, you're going to apply for funding. And this gives you a, really an opportunity to uh, find a way to pitch research that you haven't done, something that's really important for whatever career you'll uh, end up going in. 
And then beyond that, you you know you could carry out your research, uh, write your dissertation, finish your PhD, uh, and then find a job and go on to bigger and and, and better things. Um, and altogether, this uh, takes just about under five years or so. Um, our average is pretty good here uh, if you compare it to other material science and engineering programs in the United States, uh, typically on the order of um, six years or so. Uh, the national average is about six years or so. That may even be longer. Uh, given the um, uh, delays due to COVID. Um, but our average has actually stayed pretty good uh, through that time. Um, also, I want to point out that the, uh, the about 90% of the students who come into the, the PSE program leave with a PhD. This is an extremely high uh, success rate, uh, again, compared to much lower averages in other programs uh, in the United States. Um, and we think a lot of that has to do with the sort of unique aspects of the program. So in particular, uh, students get into labs pretty quickly because they don't spend two years TAing uh, as they're uh, kind of trying to support their research before they have a, a research group. Okay, so that's how you get to your PhD. What happens afterwards? Um, just one slide here on um, where students go. Um, so this is just from relatively recent years, about two thirds of the students who leave PSC uh, with PhD, um, they go into to industry, into companies, about one third go into academia. Um, these are logos from all um, kind of a, a random assortment of uh, organizations where our alumni work. Um, you'll see lots of um, technology companies, materials companies, chemical companies, as you would expect. Um, but also uh, some, some let's say, non-traditional uh, 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 research directions. So people working at the um, Library of Congress, uh, people working in um, policy development in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, we're always proud to point out um, uh, an alumna, uh, Dr. Katie Coleman, who was an astronaut. So really, this is uh, the PhD and PSC. It's, it's a launching point for really a broad array of careers, right? You're going to get a broad... Um, level of training in, um, in science uh, of uh, materials. And this can sort of put you in um, kind of on all sorts of pathways and that's up to you. Um, what's gonna be valuable for applying for jobs is these three things over here on the left. There's extensive active recruiting of many of these companies in PSC. So this is an incomplete list of companies who came into the Conti Research Building where we are to come and interview our students and seek applications just last year. Um, and so that means that you have kind of a first pass at kind of getting right in front of them and they know who you are even before they show up. Um, we have industrial partner sponsors come and visit our department twice a year um, and they come and visit the posters of students uh, who are going towards their PhD uh, and check in on their progress as they get closer and closer to graduation. Um, and so that combined with the fact with, uh, that we have uh, very strong mentoring um, activities for applying for jobs, building your resume, and an, an extensive alumni network of uh, well over 700 uh, PhDs all over the world and top companies and universities, this means that students leave with, with, with really good and competitive job offers, multiple uh, choices, um, competitive starting salaries not only for the first job, but also the opportunity to switch jobs if they want to to, to kind of work in one area and then go to another. Um, I, I, this is, again, an extremely um, uh, a good, well positioned for, for careers beyond that. So I'm going to take a few minutes to uh, spell out what goes into the application process. This is something you'll be uh, thinking about shortly if you haven't already. Um, so what is required in the application is, is what is listed uh, here. Um, you'll have to include your, your resume, uh, which lists your academic uh, credentials and, and other professional credentials that you might have, uh, other accomplishments that are relevant to uh, your PhD application. A really important part of your application is the personal statement. This is something we look at very carefully. This is your opportunity to tell us the story of why graduate school in polymer science and engineering is important to you, right? What are the events, the experiences in your life that you think will make you successful, right? What are those experiences that make you interested, passionate, curious about this field? 
Um, certainly, uh, you, as you're learning about the research in the department, if you have a certain interest and you realize that these resonate with some faculty, it's useful to point out what faculty you may be interested in working with. If you've had research experience in, in polymers or in any area, what has that taught you, right? Uh, again, that sort of helps to provide context to these questions. Um, certainly your, your personal statement, just it shouldn't be a list of, of the uh, what's already on your resume. You know, I wrote this paper, I went to this conference, I talked with this faculty member. So you should really put, that, put those uh, efforts in the context of um, what brings you to graduate school. Okay. Um, additionally, we ask for three letters of references. Uh, please uh, make sure to ask um, for references from people who really know you, uh, may, not just somebody who, who taught you in a class where you got a good grade, but somebody who, you know, who actually knows something uh, about your, your, your strengths uh, and, and why you are likely to be successful in graduate school. Um, we ask for your transcripts. Uh, in, if you're in a master's program, you're in your master's, uh, but also your undergraduate program, your undergraduate degree program. Um, and we look uh, most carefully at your courses, uh, your grades in your in your core courses. Um, again, we don't expect that you've had undergraduate training in polymer science and engineering, but uh, what was your core major? Um, the coursework in, um, in PSC is interdisciplinary, but it involves quantitative skills. And so we do look uh, somewhat at your mathematical coursework. Uh, this is something um, uh, that, that's helpful for us. Um, GRE scores, uh, I should point out that GRE scores are actually not required uh, for applications to PSC. Um, you can submit them if you happen to have taken the GRE and you think this reflects well on you, you like to share those scores, you can share them with us. Um, if you are from a non-native English uh, speaking country, um, the graduate school at University of Massachusetts requires you to submit an English language proficiency exam. Uh, as far as admission to the PSC program, this is relatively less imp important uh, to us because we, we don't have TA requirements, but it is a requirement of the graduate school. I want to point that out. Um, and um, how does this all reviewed? Uh, this is reviewed by myself, the graduate program director, as well as uh, uh, two or three other faculty. Uh, my own research expertise is, is in um, theoretical uh, polymer physics. Uh, I don't have all the expertise I need to review uh, applications coming uh, from, from people in such diverse backgrounds. Uh, so I have to rely on colleagues to uh, give additional perspectives on, on how they view your application. Um, and as you're uh, preparing your um, application, I, I we want to like to point out this little essay here. This is written by um, uh, Daniel Acevedo uh, Cartagena, um, who now works at Apple. Uh, and, and he really gives a nice perspective on thinking about your application, not just in terms of the scores you have and the metrics you hit, the numbers you hit, but really in sort of the, the holistic perspective. Right, how you bring those elements together, your past experience, uh, in a way that sort of uh, presents the, the the story for for why um, why we why you think you're going to be successful in grad school. Okay, so I I'm going to um, stop here, but I want to uh, look. Oh, here's James down here. Uh, I want to look. Uh, I'd be remiss in not emphasizing a real strength of the department is the culture of the students themselves. Um, we have a rich tradition, a strong, very strong community of um, student culture where students uh, develop and participate in a number of initiatives. Almost all of them have been proposed and developed by the students themselves. One of them uh, that, that I, I like to point out are the outreach and aspire programs. These are programs where PSC students go out to area schools and or invite those students back into PSC laboratories to introduce them to kind of the excitement of research in, in polymers and soft materials. This is a program that has been running for almost 25 years contiguously, all led by graduate students. And I think it says a lot about uh, kind of the, the passion that our students bring uh, for, um, uh, for, for the program uh, and the community excitement. Okay, so um, with that, I want to now switch to our uh, panel, uh, and I see, uh, I think our panelists are all signed on here, so I'm going to take a minute to very briefly introduce them one at a term, 
and then ask them to say a, a bit about themselves. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. James Pagaduan, uh, uh, who has undergraduate degree in chemistry and materials uh, science uh, and a master's, uh, both uh, from the Philippines. Uh, he graduated in, in 2018 and joined PSC that year, um, finished his, PS, his, his PhD and, and PSC just last spring, right? So I believe that's just under five years. Pretty good. Thanks, James. Um, uh, uh, Hao Wan uh, has undergraduate degrees uh, in polymer science and engineering and material science and engineering from the Beijing University of Chemical Technology, joined PSC in 2017. Uh, Grace Leon, uh, undergraduate degree in chemistry uh, from Pittsburgh, uh, or Pitt, uh, and graduated in 2020 uh, and joined PSC in fall of 2021. So I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and hopefully we can see everyone's faces as we start this discussion. All right. So I, what I've done is, I've, I've, as I said, I've tried to take in some of the questions that I got this year during the registration, as well as um, um, questions I've had in previous years and turned them into prompts that I'll put to the panelists to try to give their best answer. Um, but before I do that, let me ask each of them to introduce themselves, um, and I will go in order of the order that's in my Zoom window. So first, take take, take a quick moment to tell us who you are and how you got to, to, to PSC. So we'll start with you, James. Hi, everyone. I'm James Pagaduan, originally from the Philippines. And... I actually learned about PSE just by Googling um, the top polymer science program. And then definitely um, PSE was like a hit in there. And another story related to that is that I have a friend who was doing her master's in Cornell University at the time. And then she told me that PSE had a really good reputation. And so I did apply and fortunately got accepted. And I actually worked with Professor Todd Emrick and Professor Reika Katsumata as a co-advice student. I also became the president of PSE Club and one of the co-founders and the former president of the PMSE Poly Student Chapter just last academic year. And I joined DAO just recently, like three months ago, here in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, as a senior research specialist. Awesome. Thanks, James. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Hal, you are next in my, my queue here. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm really happy to join this session. So I come from uh, China and I did my uh, undergraduate and master's both in like uh, Beijing University of Chemical Technology. And I heard of uh, PIC basically just online searching for the like uh, ranking for those different programs. And also there's a um, guest professor, like Professor Tom Russell, who is like also uh, talked in like my undergraduate university. And yeah, that's basically how I know from the uh, polymer science program. Thanks. Now, Grace, that's you, you're next. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Grace. Uh, I am from Maryland. Uh, the U.S. obviously, um, and I actually learned about PSE from a bunch of people that I worked with. Uh, so I did some internships at uh, the company that makes Gore-Tex, and a lot of them, uh, a lot of the PhD scientists I work with came here, uh, and they all really, really liked it and recommended that I apply here, and I did. Uh, and now, now this is where I go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and before we jump ahead, I just just so uh, folks who are signing on can learn a little bit about the types of things that go on in PhD research, if you could each briefly tell us uh, kind of what kind of research you did in your dissertation or are doing uh, in your dissertation. Uh, James, we'll start with you. We'll go in the same order. All right. So as I mentioned, I was co-advised. And so that gave me an opportunity to be exposed in the inter interdisciplinary research, right? And so in my dissertation, I was able to devise simple strategies towards fabrication of hybrid materials, specifically electronic and porous carbon materials. And so I'm actually going to give a link for my uh, previous publications so that because we don't have much time here. But basically, yeah. um, I was able to devise zwitterist platforms, so polymer zwitter ion plus photoresist 
and also the freeze burn. So basically um, using polymer template to freeze carbon fillers and then burn the template in very fast rates to produce porous carbon materials. And so with that, I was able to marry polymer chemistry, polymer physics with engineering processes such as photolithography and rapid thermal annealing, which is definitely um, very beneficial in my job right now because I have a fundamental understanding of polymers in general. Awesome. Uh, how? What do you? What are you? What have you been working on? Thank you. So, um, actually, one of my collaborators is like Professor Grayson. Uh, so my project is about like um, study like generally is in soft matter physics, and my specifically my project is about like study how tension and curvature will influence the crystal morphology in two dimensional fluid membranes, um, and it. Like although it's a very fundamental study, but it can also provide some uh, insight for areas like uh, nanoparticle coating, like um, um, drug delivery, or even like virus assembly. So it's a really fundamental study, but also interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Al. Grace, you're up. Uh, okay, so I work mostly on making nanocomposites. Um, I make them out of polymers with functionalities that uh, I make and then synthesize those polymers and uh, lead halide perovskite nanocrystals, which are just really, really brightly emissive uh, inorganic nanocrystals. Um, and they're sort of unstable. So my goal is mostly uh, to stabilize them in a film so that eventually people can put them in electronics, like primarily LEDs, because they're so emissive. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, yeah, this just gives a little slice of the broad research that goes on here um, from polymers, soft materials to perovskites, you know, geez. Uh, um, okay, so um, we're going to jump into some questions. Um, uh, registrants had lots of questions about applications. Um, and in particular, they're, they're really interested in for tips for how they can stand out in their application, uh, if you have any. Um, so James, I'm going to throw this to you first, if you would, you know, share a bit of advice you wish someone I'd given you or or even if someone did give you and you and you want to give it to to other folks here tonight for mm -hmm. yep so i guess the main channel for you to stand out really is when you write your personal statement or statement of purpose and so i would say for writing that you should be able to demonstrate that you're a good fit that you're qualified and there's also like a personal touch and so what do we mean by a good fit that you should have a personal mission or vision in mind that actually aligns with what PSE is doing, right? And also for the qualified, as Greg mentioned a while ago, you should not just, um, just dictate or list all the achievements or classes that you took. You should also have um, some demonstration of your soft skills or like leadership, um, time management, et cetera, that are like good indication that you'll be able to be successful in your PhD career. And then lastly, you should also have some personal touch, whether be it like a maybe a sad story in your high school, something exploded in chemistry and somehow maybe that motivated you, or maybe it's more of a victory um, in like Quizby and then you actually found your passion to like pursuing more um, fundamental knowledge in physics or engineering. And I guess another thing that I would give as a piece of advice is just to be open-minded in general. Um, it might be very tempting for us to just be very focused in, in, in being interested in just one research group, but then it's also very likely for you to have competition with the other students, right, when you get into the program. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, PSE has a lot of really good faculty members and research groups. And you should really take into consideration that there's actually diverse research topics that you can actually tackle within PSE. And that's a good thing because even if you actually don't get your first choice, your advisor, um, you'll still be able to learn. And just like a very brief personal story, I didn't really choose to be co-advised, but um, it actually gave me like an opportunity to gain a wide set of skills and it's actually very beneficial, especially in the job recruitment process, because the interviewers and then the recruiters actually um, saw that in me that I have this wide range of skills and also like the adaptability 
that are necessary for uh, career growth opportunities. Fantastic. Well, that is a lot of great advice. Thank you, James. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll, we'll uh, move on uh, to the next set of questions here. Um, and I'm going to throw this to you, Hal. Um, so we have a lot of questions about what it's like, in, particularly in the first year as you're getting into the program. If you can share with us some experience about what it's like uh, in your first year classes, how you get together uh, as a group, um, get into the program. Okay, sure. Uh, so I feel like PIC really provide a like provide provide us a really good transition into our first year. Like it's like when we first go to the airport, there are people picking up, driving us back from like airport to the department. And then I remember there's time I still got a temporary housing from a senior student where like my list didn't start it. Like and also I scratched. Uh, early mentioned there are just a lot of activities in the first year like the mentoring the PIC club uh, we have like um, Halloween parties different kind of activities so it's really help especially for international student it helped me transition and feel like a fab like didn't feel alone like when I first transitioned to this like different country um, and also in terms of academic there are also a lot of um, things that can help us like like there's a advisor selection session and then um also there I, I remember there are tutors for those different classes if I have like didn't understand things well so in general I think just like almost like anything you can think of there's something that like PIC can provide you during the first year yeah sounds pretty good um, I should mention, of course, if anybody else wants to jump in with additional responses, uh, feel free just to throw your hand up. But um, otherwise, uh, we'll we'll move ahead here. Um, we heard from James and then a little bit from Hal, but um, maybe Grace, could you tell us a little bit about how you found your research group or and ultimately kind of de developed your research direction in the group? Um, what the, what's that like? Uh, yeah, so I, I found my research group, uh, just because I like I sort of coming in generally knew that I wanted to do chemistry, I didn't specifically know what kind of chemistry I wanted to do. Um, there are kind of like a lot of options in PSE. Um, and so I sort of picked my research group based on uh, who does chemistry, and then who I felt like was the best fit for me, like as a person, like what group I felt like I fit best in and what advisor I felt like most comfortable with and I thought would be the best for me as a student. Um, and so I sort of like went through a long process and I was really indecisive, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I decided I wanted to work for uh, Todd Emmerich and I do. Um, so that was great. Uh, and in terms of like deciding what I wanted to do, uh, it was sort of, part of it was about what funding he had available for projects, but there were like a few. Um, and then he and I just sort of talked together about the things that I'm interested in and the things that I'm like not interested in. Like I have no real interest in any biological applications. Um, and we sort of figured out that uh, like the the projects that he had for me to work on um, that I was most interested in that happened to be working on perovskites. Um, and then I sort of started getting in the lab and like doing preliminary experiments and kind of when some of them were successful, I like just kind of followed that trail and kept going. And I'm still sort of doing that. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Um, so we're going to move on to, uh, again, after finding a research group, um, we heard a little bit uh, from James as well about kind of working across labs. I'm going to throw this one to how we have lots of questions about um, how different students groups work together or different faculty work together. Um, so how I'm going to throw this to you, if you would share a bit about, you know, how how collaborations work either in the group or between the groups, um, how that's worked for you, how that's affected your PhD. OK, so sure. Like, um, so I there are definitely I feel a lot of collaborations happening between groups and like between like PIC department and other departments. So for example, my progress, uh, my 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 projects, like it's a collaboration with um experimental and theory. So I specifically I uh, collaborate with Dr. Grayson's group, 
and I'm doing the experiment. And there is a physical student, um, Kunun, who helped me build the model. I think this collaboration really just let me, because I'm not from a math and physical background, so um, I really learned a lot from the collaborations and help me understand like my project from a like wider and more deep. Um, and also uh, in terms of the facilities, uh, which is also mentioned in this uh, question, I think like uh, Greg mentioned, there's a lot of like in-house facilities like NMR and uh, SEM, uh, electro microscopy, which is just inside the building. So it's really convenient to um, for us uh, to do research. And also there's a lot of shared facilities and people are usually um, very like helpful if you want to just borrow some uh, equipment from other groups. Um, so to generally like it's, we can find the equipment we want. Um, um, so it's very convenient for our research. Yeah, and right. that's it. Yeah. Great. Well, so let's uh, follow up uh, that with, uh, that's kind of laboratory research. Um, James, you mentioned a little bit about your experiences outside of um, laboratory. Um, I, I've tried to emphasize again, the kind of uh, all of the student culture. Um, maybe you can share with us um, one, uh, one or two uh, stories about your experiences beyond um, lab and PSC. Uh, what do these student groups building the new student program, what that's like? Mm -hmm. Yep. So as I briefly mentioned during the introduction, I was the past president of the PSC club as well as the PMSC Poly student chapter. And so those experiences really uh, boosted my leadership skills that actually benefited me in uh, different areas of my PhD career. And so I would say the leadership definitely enabled me to be more confident in leading projects in my research and as well as working with different people um, within the student groups, right? And these are really like valuable skills because you get to be like really independent researcher, but also science cannot be just done alone, right? Science is actually um, more relevant and more impactful when you uh, get to work with other people. And so having said that, um, with this leadership exposure, I was also able to identify talents. And with that, I mean, I was able to form collaborations as well um, with other um, research groups within the department, actually, as well as students in other departments, such as the biomedical engineering department, chemical engineering, electrical engineering, and as well as um, abroad, actually, in Japan and Israel. So I was able to work with 20 collaborators. I actually just counted right before the session. And yeah, it was my first time counting it. And just because of like the leadership exposure, I was really able to become like more comfortable in working with a large group of people. And of course, like lastly, um, your time management skills is also developed uh, because of your engagement with the student groups, because you're not actually just focused on your research, right? You're all also trying to engage yourself with different student activities and you should be able to like carve out time for those. And I guess just as a bonus, right? I was also able to make really good and close friends when I actually get engaged with these student groups. And just like last weekend, I actually hanged out with in Pittsburgh with one of my very close friends that I knew from this student group. And so, yeah. That sounds pretty good. Well, thank you. Well, so we're going to bring this to a close. And the last um, questions are about, um, you know, what, what life is like after PSE. Um, I'm going to quickly ask uh, Hal and Grace to um, tell us about what your perspective is, um, what your aspirations, what you're thinking about, um, you know, in the future leave, after you leave. Um, that may be a work in progress. Um, so, so how, um, tell us what your, your, uh, post PSE career ideas are these days. Okay. Briefly. So like, I'm like a pretty senior student right now and I'm targeting to graduate like with, uh, before next summer. So like currently I'm targeting to looking for industry job, uh, because I have a, a polymer science and engineering background. 
So I'm looking for both like uh, traditional chemical companies like uh, Dow Dupont or uh, because I'm also now uh, working on lipid materials. So I'm also searching for a direction like a biotech companies. Like there is also a big like a hub of bio companies like in Boston. So I'm also targeting to look for that direction. And uh, I think PSC is really like uh, Greg and everyone mentioned like the campus recruitment is very something special for PSE. And I don't think any other, a lot of departments have this opportunity. So basically every summer, a lot of companies come into the department and we usually just get a chance, like almost 100% chance to get an interview. So that will be really helpful in terms of searching jobs and you get experience from real interviews. I think that's really helpful to me. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Grace, what are you thinking about? All right. Um, so I, I'm thinking about going in the industry because um, oh. I worked in industry for a little while before I got here and I really liked it. Um, I think I'm interested in like a primarily like pretty technical positions. Um, like I know a lot of people go into consulting, but that's not, or like that's totally a thing you can do with a PhD. Um, that's not totally what I'm looking for right now. Um, but it's like, uh, it's a few years out. <laughs> So I've got time to think about it. Um, and then because I know people who are graduating right now, I get to hear about like their experiences at their jobs and their companies, um, which is like sort of helpful to figuring out maybe where I want to aim to end up. Um, but yeah. Sounds good. You got time to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then James, this last question. So you, you've, you've shared already a lot about um, how your um, your experiences have, have helped you so far get to starting your job uh, about a month ago, two months ago now? Pretty, pretty uh, much, yeah. Oh my gosh, okay, you're well into it now. So maybe you can just share one more story about how you it, it, how you feel that PSC helped prepare you or, you know, uh, in real life mm -hmm. where you are. Now. Yeah, so I was actually doing some reflections within the last few months, but I would say that the most valuable lesson is that I was become... Uh, I became like more comfortable with being uncomfortable because PhD is a learning degree, right? And the first step to learning is recognizing that you actually don't know everything. And so with my prior experience here in PSE, um, more related to um, porous carbon materials, electronic materials, now I'm working on road marking materials. So the yellow and white stripes you see on the road, so very different, right? Um, I would say that when I started uh, working, it actually didn't bother me as much because I actually was and still am comfortable with being uncomfortable, like not knowing really uh, what's it within the road marker materials, right? But I know myself that PSE gave me the very good fundamental knowledge in terms of polymer science and engineering as well as the leadership skills that I actually acquired with my student group engagement. And so I was really able to like really get onboarded with my job like efficiently. And now I'm actually involved in four different projects. And so, yeah, but that's just like three months within. But yeah, there's already a lot happening. But I'm actually happy right now because uh, PSE definitely enabled me to become a leader and a better scientist. Okay, well, that's a great place to end it. Thanks, James. Uh, and thanks to James, Powell, and Grace um, for joining us and, and sharing your wisdom uh, with these uh, prospective students. We're going to um, wrap it up here. Let me get back. Um, here we go. Um, so um, we have just about five minutes before the end of the hour. Um, if there are um, immediate questions that maybe you came up during the panel um, or you you want to throw up, we have a, just about five minutes. Um, if you don't feel comfortable raising your hand now um, and you want to stick around to the Gather Town chat, um, we'll switch over in a few minutes uh, and you can stick around, ask me, ask Lisa Groth, ask uh, some of the panelists uh, and students. Um, who, who will be around to, to chat with you. So are there any um, any questions? If you have a question, raise your hand. Oh, 
I think there's something in the chat. I can't see it though. Okay. So if there are no questions, um, I'm going to uh, call it uh, an evening uh, here. Um, we'll be in touch uh, uh, by email with lots of links and contacts. Again, there's lots of information here to process. Um, if you don't hear from us uh, or those links, you can't find the information you want, you can feel free to uh, reach out to any of these three um, email addresses, uh, email me directly, Lisa Groff, PSC graduate uh, at UMass, that's uh, Madeline, uh, and we'll get the information to you as soon as we can. Um, and um, with that, uh, let me switch over here. Uh, Madeline, if you would introduce uh, the Zoom uh, setup for folks who are gonna stick around. Hi, uh, gather down. Sorry, there's apology. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yes, gather down. Uh, my name is Madeline. I help out with recruiting and PSC. Um, many of you may have already emailed me, um, but we're going to head over to GatherTown for the informal chat session. Um, so when you click on the link, I just put it in the chat. Um, it'll ask you um, for permission to um, have access to your webcam and your microphone. Um, and that's that's vital to to have you know conversations with everyone. Um, you can put your name. And then once you get into the space, um, you can use your arrows to move around in the space. Um, and then there will be different um, setups where you can um, learn about different topics you're interested in. Um, and you'll notice as you approach different people, you'll be able to see them and hear them um, and talk to different people. And then um, I'll be at the help desk on the bottom if you have any questions. Um, but yeah, we'll see you in gather time. Okay. Well, uh, with that, um, thank you, uh, everyone. Thanks again for taking the time this evening for signing on. Um, again, we'll meet you over in GatherTown uh, if you have more questions, things you'd like to discuss. Otherwise, you'll be hearing from us. Um, and again, um, have a good evening. I'll stick around here for a minute or two if anybody has any immediate questions and want to chat chat to me directly um, before we jump over together. Thank you, James, Hal, Grace. All right, look, let's see if they left all. Kiki, you have your hand up. You want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question? Oh, um, I feel like I kind of forgot to ask about this. So I was wondering we're not doing rotation like in the graduate program, right? Yes, there are not rotations, right? So that's a good question. Are there rotations? There are not rotations in um, lab rotations. Um, the main, well, okay, the, the the main, I'd say reason for that is that we would like to get you into a lab relatively quickly, but we also want to give some time and opportunity for you to meet the different research groups. Um, so some some graduate programs, you, before you even show up, you, you, you make a commitment to an advisor um, some graduate programs, like my graduate program in, in physics, people didn't have a research group until the end of their first year, the end of the summer. And it took a long time to graduate uh, in my graduate program. Uh, and so there's a balance in between kind of getting people into groups quickly, um, but also giving them an opportunity to actually learn and meet um, with their groups. Um, yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for coming. Okay, well, Lisa, we had a quieter group this evening than this this uh, morning. Ah, okay, uh, Tfiza, you can go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. My, my name is, my name is Jifa from Jifa. Ghana. Huh? Ah, welcome. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask one question concerning uh, one of the information on the third year where you said independent research proposal. Uh huh. Uh, I wanted to find. I wanted to find out is it uh different from your thesis work, more uh, like you are just 
trying something or you are being trained on how to write a proposal or is in line with your work. So I just want yes. to be clear on that. Great question. Um, thanks for, for asking. Um, so the, the independent research proposal is a proposal. Um, so uh, how just completed his, I, I, I know. Um, it's a proposal for a project that is not your dissertation, right? That's different from your dissertation. In fact, you don't even, you, you likely won't intend to, to even carry it out, um, but you, 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 you propose it as if you would carry it out, as if you were um, applying for funding. Um, some people, um, particularly people who go on to academic careers, they, they, they keep those proposals and they keep working on them. Um, develop them, maybe even develop them in for um, proposals for postdoctoral fellowships. Uh, so it's it's an opportunity for training, um, but we think it's a pretty valuable opportunity to learn how to write, um, how to ask people for money to to do what you want to do, um, and uh, why they should give you money to to do the research. To, this is this is really important for whatever career you're going to have. Great question. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah. I'm, I'm Michelle. Yeah. Thank you very much. Just a quick follow-up. Will you be great on it? Uh, from Bangladesh. Can you hear me clearly? I can hear you clearly. How are you? Yeah. Thanks for joining. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm okay. Uh, in your slide, uh, you have mentioned that the backgrounds from where the PSC students came. So I am from textile engineering department uh, and yes. having CGP of 3.94. Uh, so is it a problem of being a textile engineering department background for PSC program? But because I have a great fascination on this program. And uh, I, take, uh, I take three consecutive terms polymer engineering course in my department. So uh, is it okay or not? We have lots of people who, who enter the program with a background in textile, who come from textile engineering program. Um, so there's definitely not a problem. Um, okay. So again, you know, the, the main, the most important thing to say is that, um, you know, almost, at least in the United States, there are very few people come in with an undergraduate background in polymers. Um, you know, there are programs in China, as we hear, and uh, places in India as well, but not, not so much the United States. So we don't expect people to know polymers. You're, you should bring your background and then learn polymers here. And that's why everybody's taking the same courses together because we're starting from the same level and then going up together. Um, okay. I have another question. Is any prerequisite program is needed for starting the PhD program? Is so, there any prerequisite? Uh, is there any prerequisite program to be performed? No. And another question is that uh, uh, in your time, independent uh, research proposal, uh, if uh, the proposal should be confined in the PC lab or not, um, if the other labs of the university can be used. Yeah, so for the independent research proposal, as I was just answering uh, the question that asked, it's, it's, a re it's a proposal that you won't actually do the research. So you may even uh, make a proposal to do a project that you don't even have the equipment to do, right? But you, in the proposal, you say, I will get the equipment, I will, this is the equipment I need, uh, or I will travel to a national lab to use uh, some neutron scattering technique in order to do my research. Um, so you're writing a proposal, uh, developing a proposal idea, uh, really to sort of train for how you, how you, how you start from a scientific question, find an opportunity, uh, define that question and explain how you can try to answer it scientifically and then figure out how much it costs uh, to, to raise funds for that research. Um, so this is something that all of the faculty do in the department is they, they apply for research funding. Um, and when students leave, and particularly if they're entering academics, or even if they're working in industry, they have to um, they have to explain um, why they're working on one project or another. So this is an opportunity for you to train in that area, not necessarily to do the project. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. 
So I have I have a, another off topic to uh, to, uh, to have a question that I have a okay. baby and uh, uh, I see that the university uh, bears the insurance for me if I get admitted. So what about the baby? So is uh, is her responsibility is on mine? or I can get any kind of support because I came from a third world country. It's very uh, costly to live in USA for me with my baby. So what about the uh, university policy about it? Is there, is there any policy or not? Uh, so I don't know, Lisa, if you want to jump in, I mean, I guess the first point to make, I guess, is it about the health insurance in the, the United States is the, the health insurance program, I think, it should be available as well for family members. Yes. Uh, and there are on-campus resources, um, for example, for, for, for childcare, for daycare. Um, they're not free. Okay. There, there'll be, there'll be a cost to them. Um, uh, Lisa, I don't know if you have any other, uh, kind of thoughts or options about, um, material. Yeah, no, I don't have that much more to share, except, you know, we do have the individual health insurance and the family plan. And uh -huh. um, most of, you know, the individual plan, the department is 95% of your insurance is paid for. Um, yeah. And then the family plan, a good portion of that is paid as well. Yeah. The, I mean, what we can, uh, again, with we, we follow up, we have some links. So the graduate students at the university are part of a union, and the union will negotiate for benefits for the graduate students. Uh, and so one of the benefits that they they always push for are for resources for family um, and for, for students with families and need family support. Uh, so I, I can maybe point you to some of the resources uh, that they have for what's available. Um, what are the benefits? Um, thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, there's another good, uh, another question here. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you. It's Jifai again. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much for the, op the opportunity. I have a background in the first my undergraduate in molecular biology and a master's degree in microbiology. Okay. But when I when I saw the stars, it's a similar question as my colleague asked earlier. I realized most of the people were physics, chemistry background with your current um uh, student intake. Uh, I wanted to find out that even though it stated that the the biology student to are welcome and can apply, do I really have a chance? Because I've not done a lot of math programs uh, and little of chemistry and physics but most of them were biological related sure. program uh, do i have a, a chance to that yeah no that's and, a uh, fair it's a fair question and again you know while while there are um students mostly from chemistry chemical engineering material science a few from polymers you know there are many students who come in with unusual backgrounds in computer science or aeronautical engineering, um, physics and math, um, and biology, right, uh, as well as undergraduate degrees and, and pre-medical uh, programs. So they definitely have a, a chance um, as you think about applying, you know, what's most important in this personal statement is to say, well, this is what I've learned from my background uh, about, um, you know, molecular biology or microbiology, but this is what the opportunity I would like to address in my research, right? In my PhD, I already, I've already developed strength in this area. This is what I see the opportunity is and why I want to, um, want to, to, to get a PhD in polymer science and soft materials, right? So you, it's certainly not um it's not a disadvantage uh certainly as, as well as long as you can explain you know this is what this is why this makes sense to you and uh, what are the types of research that you think you would be able to do as a PSE student um that okay. you couldn't do as a molecular biology 
in a molecular biology program, right? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Just a quick one. I also wanted to find out uh, in case maybe you're having difficulty in some of the courses that you're taking, is yep. there um, more of like a different training for you, maybe a special training for you so that you can catch up with your colleagues? Is there something like that? Yeah, great question. Um, so the answer is yes. And I guess I would say that every student needs that training like because, because the there's no student who has exactly all of the background, right? Um, and so they might have be real strong in one area, but one area they're disaster, right? They have never studied. They have to start from scratch, like a, you know, first year undergraduate. And so they need help and they need to help to help each other. And so as, as how was men mentioning, um, the first year students themselves, they, they work together. There's also tutoring by the more senior graduate students where they will work outside of class to help you fill in the gaps, uh, in your program. From your undergraduate if you didn't come in with uh, kind of a, a serious training in one area and you need to develop strength and i should mention also that our um cumulative exam process i i mentioned this uh this starts in the second semester the exam process is that you there are six cumulative exams um one um every other month starting in uh february of your of your um, second semester and you have to pass three out of six, which means that you can fail. And in fact, most students fail one or two or three exams, right? We understand that when you learn this new material, you're not going to get it the first time. You're going to try and you're going to realize, oh, I didn't get it. That was bad. I have to go back. I have to study again. Um, and then you try again. Uh, and then you get it by um, by the end of the process. So most, you know, again, Almost 90% of the students, they get through the process. It's not, they get there. If you get accepted into the program, you may have to work a little bit harder in some areas. Um, you may have to seek out those resources, but that's really part of the the way that we train students is that you we don't expect you to know before you get here. We want to provide the platform uh, and the incentives um, and the team uh, to help to help you get that training before going on to your, your dissertation work. Thank you very much. Uh, I think some of us have the, the zeal and the ability to take on things that are quite challenging. So if yeah. given the opportunity, I'm sure we'll do better and do great. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, that's, that's what we like to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. No, welcome. Mm -hmm. Dima, I put the link for the information uh, regarding our union in the um, in the chat, if you wanted to click on that, it'll bring you to the information on child care and, and uh, insurance. Yeah, I have got it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So Li Liberty, I see uh, you have your hand up. Go ahead and meet yourself. Thank you very much, Anna. So uh, I've learned so much from you. Appreciate. I only have two questions. Uh, the first question I would like to ask is that how do students meet with professors who are not their their direct advisor? Like, do students have access to learn from them and to gain knowledge from them too? Like, often aside from their primary their main supervisor. And yeah. I also like to ask, um, like, are there opportunities for internship in companies during the, yeah. the, the years of the PhD program? Yeah, so these are great, two great questions. Um, so the first one is that there are uh, quite a lot of opportunities to learn from other faculty, um, First of all, of course, you would meet all, almost all the faculty in the first year courses. Um, but the other opportunities you have are through your uh, dissertation committee, right? So you'll form a committee 
which is made up of your advisor, but also experts which may be outside of your field, right? And the dissertation committee is there to provide input and feedback on your dissertation and, and do exactly what you said, um, give you an opportunity to, to work with them. Um, I also, you know, I, I work and mentor students from other research groups all the time. Um, even if we're not officially collaborating. So I very often, uh, because we do research in, in mo developing models and solving models, this is useful for lots of experimental problems. So students will come to me and they'll bring me some problem and they'll try to get input and advice just informally. Um, that's the environment for the, um, the, the faculty uh, in this department. I, Again, I, I, I think it's important to know that our program is only graduate students. So it means that the faculty really are fully focused on PhD students and advising and mentoring PhD students, not just their students, but other students. So I think that's a real, um, there's lots of opportunities for those types of interactions. Uh, your second question was about internships. So yeah, there are plenty of students who pursue internships. Uh, um, typically towards the end of their PhD. That's something you would discuss with your advisor. Um, there are a lot of companies that will have you come and work for them for a bit, uh, and perhaps that might lead to uh, some job offer. Um, that's, that's becoming more and more typical. Um, I should also mention that there are many projects and funded projects in the department that are sponsored by industry, so with industrial partners. So you also, in your PhD work, get to meet with um, industrial partners, learn about what's valuable to companies, meet people working in companies. Um, I would say there's no shortage of opportunities for um, getting yourself in front of people working in different types of companies and um, learning how to translate your, your expertise to what's valuable to some, to some company. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sure. Yes, sir. Thank you both. Sure. Well, if there aren't any more questions, um, are there any more questions? There aren't, I might go and pop over to the Gather Town session and see if uh, there are questions over there. Um, you all are welcome to join um, over there in Gather Town. You may probably have to sign out of Zoom in order to get Gather Town to work because um, Gather Town also wants to use your, your camera on your computer uh, and Zoom won't let it use your camera if, if um, you're trying to use Gather Town. Okay, so I'm going to sign off, Lisa. And uh, before I do, I'm going to save this. All right. Save this we'll chat. See you shortly. Yeah, hang on. How do I do that? How do I save the chat? Remember how to do that? Down on the bottom, there's three buttons. Save chat. Yeah, on, the, on the right? Oh yeah, thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Yep. All right, ciao. I'll see, see you tomorrow. Okay. I'll see you over there. Thank you.